Good afternoon. Lovely to be with you again. Today, we're going to talk about a very special topic. And um, it's about epigenetics. So before we learn about epigenetics, how about us learning a few things about genetics? So all of us are aware of genetics. We all have DNA in our cells. Every cell of our body, exceptions are there, a few, which do not have the DNA, but every cell of our body carries DNA. And what is DNA? DNA is basically like an instruction manual. How the cell should work, how it should multiply, how it should produce chemicals, how it should produce um, energy. So these are just a few functions that I have written, uh, told you. There are a lot more functions that go on within our cells. And all those functions have instructions the cell follows. So if you were to take all the DNA that is in one of your cells and were to, you know, it's, it's like a coil. You've got to stretch it out and you put it one after another. It would extend about two meters. All the information in each cell, if you were to put it one after another, like a string, uh, it'll extend almost two meters. And if you take all the DNA that you've got in your body and you put that in a straight line one after another, you could reach um, the planet Pluto and come back. That's how much of information that is there. If you were trying to um, type all the information and you were typing 60 words per minute and you worked eight hours a day, every day, it would take you 50 years to type all this information that is there in your, inside the cell which is in the DNA. If you were to print a book, you would print about a thousand books with all that information, just information. So where is the DNA? This uh, DNA is inside the nucleus, so you can see a circular structure right inside the cell and inside that is all the DNA that is from the nucleus as we call it. And every cell of your body has exactly the same information, the same DNA. We all start life with some information from our dad and some information from our mom. They come together and it becomes one cell. And from that one cell, it starts div dividing. So one cell becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, and number of cells increase. And based on what's in the DNA, the information from my dad and from my mom, we then start producing specific characteristics. So after a while, the cell starts deciding whether it's going to become a liver cell. And that cell then multiplies to become the liver cell. And the DNA has all the information as to what should be the size of this um, organ. What should it be its function? You know, how are the arteries, vessels and all, they come in and get, you know, joined to it. And so the whole body then becomes a beautiful system. Now you may ask, this DNA, how, is, how does it fit inside the nucleus, which is so tiny? Our largest, large cells, I would say, could range, it can be pretty large, but you know, on the average, you can say about 20 micrometers. So how much is a micrometer? If you take a um, millimeter and chop it a thousand times, that is one micrometer. And if you were to take 20 parts of that, now how tiny would that be? That's the size of a cell and inside that this two meter long you know strand has to be fitted in so for that to happen it gets arranged in such a way and it gets coiled and again coiled and um, you know have you seen these ropes they use thick ropes how they get coiled that's how our DNA material gets coiled and it gets fitted inside our cell into, to be more specific inside the nucleus. And what happens as well is that it gets um, into different chromosomes as we call it. So this two meter length of DNA gets 
you know, put into chromosomes of small portions. Now, why is that important? It's because we have begun to identify the scientists that are looking into this DNA, and they can actually say, where is the information for the eyes? Where is the information for the liver? Where is the information for your neurons? So the, each cell has all the information required. But the cell, when it becomes a cell of the brain, doesn't need all the information that has to do with the liver and the kidneys. It just needs information that has to do with the brain function. And again, I'm, I'm generalizing this brain function. There's so many kinds of cell in your brain. It's not just one type of cell. And so here we find um, from one cell, we start multiplying and then dividing. And what happens is you have specific organs being taken care of specific cells, but all the cells have the same DNA. Yeah? And because it becomes so specific, you don't start growing a tooth in your eye, do you? The cells in the eye specialize in the work of the eye. And so one cell grows into 70 trillion cells. Now how much is 70 trillion? If you were to take one second to say hello to one cell of your body, and you continue doing that day and night, you would take 1.5 million years to finish saying hello to all your cells in the body. We don't even live that long. Far from that. And so, I said these DNA gets packed into chromosomes. And in the DNA strand, there are portions which have to do with specific uh, function or specific organs. So you can see that gene written there in part of the DNA, strand of DNA. So that gene would deal with certain function in your body or certain organ in your body. And several genes are responsible. I'll give you an example. So this is one of the pictures I um, have put up for you. You can see that there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. And in each pair, obviously, there are two strands or two chromosomes. Now, for your eye color, there are at least eight genes that influence the color of the eye. Eight genes. And many of these genes that we're talking about, which has to do with the eye, is on chromosome number 15. So if you look at that again, you can see number 15 there. Yeah, so that portion has genes which determine what the eye color is going to be. So imagine for all the functions and work that needs done, there are genes. Apparently, we have about 25,000 genes for our functions in the body. Now, you may say, if that is true, that we, everything that happens in our body has to go with our DNA and genes, why is it that in twins who have identical genes, would you say, why is it that as life progresses, they seem to have more and more differences between them? Environmental, Environmental factors, yes. Stress is another thing. The life choices make a big difference. Do you know people who smoke? And if you see between twins, the, uh, the person who smokes will have a lot of wrinkles and skin changes. The twin that doesn't smoke would look a lot younger. Also diabetes. We find if you have a twin, one who hasn't kept lifestyle, uh, hasn't bothered about lifestyle in their life, you find they have diabetes. While the other, of the twin, would have been very, you know, rigorous in exercise and eating right, and they don't have diabetes. The same gene. And there goes our excuse saying, oh, this is all my genes, I can't help it. This is how I was born, this is how I will live, and I would get diabetes if I have to, and that's in my genes. Nothing that I can do. But science is teaching us that is far from true. Your genes don't change, but something else changes. Something else perhaps decides what's going to happen, depending on how you live. We use words like genotype and phenotype. So genotype is basically what your gene is. Phenotype is what you look like. 
Okay, you look at this uh, butterfly. It came from that caterpillar. Did the genes change when the caterpillar turned into a butterfly? No. It's the same gene. But the expression of that gene has changed. You'll get it as we you know, talk through a bit more. What is this expression? Now, this is an orchestra. Lots of musicians, some playing the piano, some in playing wind instruments, some playing you know, the violin. And suppose we give them a piece to play. OK, what shall we say, Vivaldi? Um, it's a nice piece, is there? Or Beethoven, or whatever. You give the music to them, and that's like the DNA. OK, it's all printed out, and that's the way the song or the music should go. But you know, depending on the conductor, the whole music can sound different. He could go slow, he could go fast, he could bring about a swell in the volume, or he could go soft. And he could cause so much of variations just by the way he leads the musicians. And this is how you can express the same music differently based on certain other factors. And we will call this epigenetics, that which is around and um, if, you know, having an effect on the genes, like the conductor decides how to express the music that they have. So we call it gene expression. OK, you have the gene, great, but how is it expressed? And what affects this ex expression? We're beginning to realize that is even more important. So I don't want to get into details, but just to give you an idea. So we just said that the DNA strands have to get coiled up, right? If you coil it up really tight, then those genes kind of get hidden. And you can't read the information there. So you have the gene, but you can't read the information. What is in there, it is not going to help. If you have a portion in your body of a gene that tells you how to stop cancer, and if that gene gets blocked up, that it can't be read, what will happen? You will get cancer. OK. Same way, there may be genes that, that may help you not to get diabetes. And if that gene gets closed because of your lifestyle choices, what will happen? You will get diabetes. Now, the question people ask, can these changes be reversed? Yes, they can be reversed as well, most of them. We don't change the gene. We must be clear about that. We change its expression. So if we have protective genes that help give us information how to fight cancer. So we have gene expression, which makes it active. And you can have gene suppression as well. So that that gene, which is protective, is no longer seen, or that information cannot be read. I'll give you some examples, and things will get clearer. So. There is this page on Commons Wikimedia, and I found that quite interesting. And uh, the diagram is very interesting too. So there are certain mechanisms right from the time you're in your mother's womb. You can't do anything about that now. But it'll be good for us to realize that when someone's pregnant, how much of a difference it makes to the child, what the mother eats, how the mother feels, what goes on in their mind, it makes a huge impact on the child. Um, there are papers that tell us that when the child, and I'll come to that again, when the child is in the uterus, what the mother eats can determine if they are going to be more susceptible to become diabetics. OK, so also your um, mental issues as well. After the child is born, there are studies that show, this is on mice, by the way, OK? We can't do on human beings, it's difficult. But lit on mice, when a baby is born and the mother is very huggy and you know, cuddles up and licks the baby mice, those mice have less anxiety problems when they grow up. And if a, if a mice is neglected when it's young by the mother not paying much attention, not licking, not hugging, the child grows up with high anxiety issues. 
Does that explain some of our issues in society today? Yes. And so you find that diagram where you've got this little wheel-like stuff, you see? So the DNA has got coiled. And if it's, it has to get coiled to get um, packaged into the nucleus. Now, if it gets packed in such a way that those genes which help us to be healthy, and I'm making broad you know, statements in these, those genes, you see the pink area there? In those purple circles with the blue interiors? Yeah, those pink areas, that is perhaps a gene. And it can be red. And you see further on, if you see the one with the histone tails, perhaps I'll come forward there and point it out to you. You see this portion here? It can be easily read because it's exposed. Look at this one here. It is coiled up and it gets a bit more difficult for it to be read. You get the picture here? Yes. And this coiling mechanism depends on certain chemicals that come and get attached to the DNA. And when it attaches there, it's like a key mechanism or like a book. You put you know, tags onto it, the important information. It's something like that. So where do these tags come from? You see this book has got tags because those are important information that you want to read. And so the body immediately knows, right, I need to read that segment of information that's going to help me fight cancer or perhaps some other lifestyle disease. It comes from diet, which is rich in methyl groups. So we won't get into the details again, but you see those picture, that picture with all those veggies there, okay? So what we know is the nutrients that comes from food can determine which part of your gene is being exposed. So if you eat lots of veggies, if you have lots of fruits, with them, this is a great paper if you would like to read that through, with them comes fiber. Remember that word fiber? Yes, very important. And why do we need fiber? What eats the fiber? Remember we talked about microorganisms within us? The microbiome, the gut microbiome, yes. These vegetables and fruits also gives you vitamins and minerals. They are very important for the processes going on in your cell. If you have deficiencies, then many of these processes won't function, okay? They also have what we call as phytochemicals and antioxidants. Have you heard of antioxidants? Yeah, antioxidants prevent the decay of our information in our cells. They prevent damage to our DNA and so on, and our cells as such. And anti-inflammatory agents as well. You know when you have animal-based foods, your inflammation levels go up. Inflammation is no good. It puts your body in a big stressful situation. And when stress comes and your body can't build, it starts breaking down, okay? I'm putting things in the most simple way I can, but things are a lot more complicated than that. So what you eat, what your physical activity is like, if you've got stress, if you've got toxins in your body, it is going to inhibit the protective mechanisms in our body. And that's why in epigenetics we find that identical twins they make choices in life like all of us do. But in their case, we find quite a bit of a difference based on what they choose. So if you smoke, the twin that smokes obviously will have changes in their body. The twin that eats junk food all the time compared to the other one who eats healthy, obviously it will have more diseases. Again, they have the same DNA, but their epigenetics have been changing based on how it's coming into the body and how it's affecting it. So this is, this is a bit more in terms of information, but we'll simplify it. We call it DNA methylation profiles of vegan and non-vegetarians in the Adventist Health Study to cohort. So this DNA methylation, what basically it means, the food that are rich with methyl groups 
and things like folic acid and so on and many vitamins and minerals. When they get into your body, they put bookmarks as we have learned already. And these bookmarks help us to fight long-term disorders. It prevents you from getting into diabetic problems. It prevents cancer as well. So there are this methylation going on all the time in our body. Vegetarian or plant-based diets are rich in polyphenols and secondary plant metabolites that could inhibit cancer. And again, this paper says that diets high in animal-based and fatty foods may generate pro-inflammatory compounds. So again, inflammation is something we don't want. There's something in our body called tumor suppressor genes. Okay, now this is specific, tumor suppressor genes. What they do is their job is to slow down the division of our cells. Okay, so our cells then divide in a proper synchronized methodical ma manner. What is cancer? When the cells go berserk, they just start multiplying. Why does that happen? Because this tumor suppressor gene, which suppresses cancer, itself gets suppressed because it becomes invisible. Okay. And then the cell starts growing so fast there's no one to control it. And tumors occur. What does diet that is full of methyls and folates, all that goodies that come from plant-based foods, what do they do? They show this gene. And so our body knows exactly what to do. Isn't it interesting how it's not your DNA now? It's got, its information is important, but it's your epigenetics, which is greatly influenced by what you eat. That makes a huge difference. Now in mammals, we are supposed to be part of the mammal kingdom. There's something called as a goatee, a goatee gene. They did this experiment in mice. And they found that when the agouti gene is expressed, the person, the, I'm sorry, the mice, was yellow and sickly and large. You see that yellow, golden yellow mice? Looks cute, but it's a sick mice. When they fed the mothers, thought of goodies, Okay, like methyl, folate, and vitamins and minerals, along with their normal food. The offspring, the kids that arrived, many of them were not uh, you know, looking yellow and sickly. They were looking prim and proper and brown, like healthy mice should. What was the difference? The mothers were fed with the right diet. And so I was telling you, we'll come back to this maternal influence you know, today we find many of the children having problems like ADHD, anxiety disorders. I agree there are other issues going on as well, but we suspect that it is a lot to do also with the diet of the mother. There's smoking, there's alcohol. You know, there were times when mothers, when they become pregnant, they'd be very careful what they ate and where they went, <coughs> how they were thinking, yes? But obviously things have deteriorated in our society that pregnancies are not planned. And even if they are planned, the mother is so addicted she can't stop her drugs. Yes. And so this is a great uh, experiment that was done. This was done almost 20 years ago. And since then, we have come to know a lot more. Again, this is a methyl-rich diet. When it's taken, the pups were brown and stayed healthy for life. So genetics is important, but don't stop at that. We can't do anything about what we have inherited. But if we make changes in our life through epigenetics, <laughs> we can, to quite a degree, reverse some of these ill effects. And you may say, well, I've become quite old now. There's no hope for me. I would say no. These genes, not everything, there are limitations, but many of these genes can be reversed. I was reading in three months, apparently, 250 of your genes can be switched back within three months if you turn to a plant-based diet. Wow. 
that's a lot of a change. Yes, and I don't have a list of what are those changes that is going to happen, but in a blanket, it's going to make you healthier, it's going to make you less at risk to have heart attacks, to start reversing your diabetes. Now, we don't use that word reversing because it makes you give the, gives you the false security where once it's reversed, you're fine, but no. We have seen people who have gone on plant-based diet who could decrease their blood pressure medicines. It's not just about losing weight. It's about reversing the damage that has been done to you. When they go into plant-based diet, some people who are on medicines, even on insulin, we can get rid of that. If you start eating plant-based diet, your sugars will start dropping. Okay, so get your doctor involved when you start making these changes. There are people that I have been working with who have had severe psoriasis. Have you, do you know psoriasis? They've had issues with their joints. There was a lady who had uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which is an inflammatory condition. She went off all animal products and just went on plant-based foods. And there were some specific things that she, you know, even plant-based she went off, but we won't get into that. And she doesn't use any more of those immunosuppressive medications anymore. She walks around, her joints still have a bit of deformity, but she's freely using it. No medications, no painkillers. So things do happen. If you make those changes, your epigenetics, your epigenome, is going to go back to where it should be. And you will find a relief from many of your illnesses. So this basically is what we have talked about in the past as well. Yeah, so nutrition is important. Along with that, the other lifestyle changes. Okay, you've got to exercise. Water is so important. We talked about sunlight, temperance, and so on. There's a lot more evidence I could present to you. We just don't have the time. I would encourage you to go back and look up epigenetics. And you'll get a lot of information coming through. So we talked about physical and mental health. Is there something we haven't discussed today? The spiritual part of your life. And this is again that's coming back to us. Life is a holistic approach that you need to think about. Life is not just about your body. Life is not just about your mental health. But it joins up together with spiritual well-being as well. If you're not at peace, if there are things that are bothering you within you, and you ask questions like, what is this life all about? What happens if I'm going to die? Where do I go? Is there something beyond what I already know? Should I search? Just as you're going to search uh, for epigenetics, I suggest you start searching about regarding the answers for these questions. So thank you very much. And if you have uh, further questions, once we're finished with our cooking, I'll come back and you can ask. Thank you very much. <laughs>